All right. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, I guess, tuning in. Sorry I couldn't be there uh, in person. Just travel things didn't work out. But, um, you know, curious, uh, you know, I wish there was a way to get good feedback. I would normally want to ask here, like, how many folks are in API product? But we see kind of an uptick in this lately. And it's certainly from our customers at Stoplight, a question we hear a lot. So um, let's get into it. Yes, first of all, uh, why should you listen to me? Uh, I'm Jason Harmon, the CTO at Stoplight. Um, and I'll tell you a brief bit about Stoplight, but about me, uh, I oversee kind of all of our geeky stuff. So engineering, product, security, IT. Um, I also host a podcast called the API Intersection. And that's not just a plug, it's, it's relevant to the topic today because I feel like a lot of what we're sharing here, we've kind of picked up from guests on the podcast where we talk to folks who are sort of in that platform transformation or um, you know, doing some kind of API and push initiative where they run a big program and we kind of ask you know, what works well for them. Um, I've kind of been Stoplight's target customer uh, prior to working here for the last two years. Uh, so I've led a lot of different efforts at, at big places you'd probably recognize like Expedia Group and PayPal, but also at some startups like Typeform and Uship. So uh, Stoplight, uh, this is the other thing that I think lends credibility is our, our customers do this kind of stuff, right? We're a collaborative API design platform. Uh, so we basically help our customers kind of get their API programs to an effective place, starting from the whiteboard. That is to say, from the time that it's uh, you're taking it, an idea and turning it into a design uh, and getting it into a place where it makes sense to go develop, which is also to say that we take this kind of API first slash API, uh, design first approach. That's the end of my shilling. So um, it's almost funny, I think, in 2022 to say, you know, what is the business value of APIs, uh, at least from my perspective. But I do find that in a lot of organizations, it's still very much a discussion when it comes to making the investment on the roadmap. And uh, I find that in a lot of places, we get hung up on a lot of other things and skip this essential first step is what's the business value of uh, you know, going and building some APIs. So the good news is uh, there's, there's data out there for this now. Um, you know, we've been doing this long enough as kind of a, a space that um, some smart folks um, have gone and done studies and actually pulled like comparatives over as long as a 16 year period, essentially since there have been companies focused on building APIs as products. You know, we like to like the Twilio's of the world, right? And uh, there is a distinct competitive advantage to the tune of 12.7% more growth on a 16 year timeline. So, you know, right out of the gate, you've got justifying data and kind of reporting out there on, you know, properly conducted studies, which for a long time we didn't have. So it was sort of, but look at them, they're doing good, right? Uh, and now I think we've got a broader picture of the impact this makes. Um, I think it's important, first off, um, a lot of times you'll hear folks kind of go, you know, um, we need to build APIs because that's what I read in some business journal, right? You'll, you'll get an exact push on things like that. Or, you know, your engineering teams are going like, this is just obvious, why aren't we doing this? This is crazy. Um, and I think it's first important to break down that, you know, platform is kind of what everyone's going for. And it's important to recognize that that tends to mean at least two different things. Uh, but I think at a high level, there's kind of two schools of thought that don't always clearly intersect. Um, the first is kind of this MIT school of thought, the, the idea of building a composable business. And this, this term is starting to really resonate among business leaders. And it's, you know, what we think of as kind of a modular system. Right, that you have these reusable components that plug in together, they play well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think implicit with that is kind of these inverse Conway maneuver kind of things of, you know, let's uh, build things in customer language, not system centric, but we'll touch on that more. The second piece, and I think sometimes people get confused on which thing they're doing, um, is that you're building a marketplace, right? That is a form of, of platform design. Um, but the way in which you would look at how you do that or why you do that, it can be pretty different. Um, and that is that you're focused more on how to build kind of this ratchet back and forth of supply and demand to build, a, you know, a could be two-sided or multi-sided marketplace where you've got folks kind of bringing the supply for others to consume. Um, it's worth noting, though, that quite often both are true in that you're building a composable architecture but it needs to be built in the shape of a marketplace. 
um, but how you might approach those in terms of their priority might be different. So there's an optimal way to build the system in a composable way. And there's an optimal way in which you would want to build a marketplace, making sure that those things match up, you know, uh, don't, don't let that be uh, lost on you. Um, the other side of, of kind of marketplace dynamics, and it's, I think it's true in general, but it's especially important in marketplaces is um, that network effects are a big thing and hopefully the positive ones, right? Um, that is to say that, um, you know, direct monetization is not always easy to, to sort of identify. And sometimes you're working on, you know, this sort of notion of come for the value, stay for the network, that quantifying that network effect and using that as a proxy for what should lead to growth and building confidence in those proxies uh, is often the right way to look at things. So I think we're primarily going to talk um, about kind of this more composable business thing here. Um, but probably touch on marketplace stuff. And I just wanted to call that out. So fair enough, APIs are important, right? I think uh, pretty clear these days. Uh, and if it's not an important discussion in your company, hopefully that gives you a little bit of fuel to get the discussion going. So, you know, if we're gonna do this as a product, that's the point of this talk, uh, how do we treat them? And uh, I think, you know, my starting point is, it's just another product. Like uh, I think people get kind of, wrapped around the axle on these things sometimes and um, you know, try to think this is a whole new world, it's technical and so we've got to do everything different. Um, but you know, let's kind of get into what that means. So there's a couple of things that we'll touch on here. Uh, the first is kind of understanding the business relationships that APIs might open up that you might not have had before. Uh, the second, and this is kind of going back to where we started is making sure that you have the right business buy-in and how to think about framing that. And then uh, you know we'll spend most of the time on those, and then the last one is just sort of a, a an obvious freebie to me, and uh, something that I've been passionate about for a long time is how to think about kind of testing, but from the product manager's perspective, and why it's so valuable for you in API uh, development. So this first one, recognizing relationships. Um, I think for anyone that's gone down the road of hey, let's go build an API, open it up, uh, you find out very quickly that. The business of integration is kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe and messy, right? You're often working on very intimate terms with some other team's developers. You know, sometimes it's developer to developer, team to team on how do we get this thing working? Um, and that's some component of the relationship is how are you gonna support this thing and all that stuff. But the bigger uh, picture is what's the business relationship that this enables? So I like to start with, you know, what, who are the constituents involved here? What kind of relationships are we, we fostering with these connections to our platform? And it's essential that you're thinking of, uh, you're operating, I think, discussing, you know, everything you do in a customer-centric way. Um, this often, you know, leads down the road of how do we talk like customers talk so that we're not speaking in weird acronyms and getting lost in the, in the forest, but, you know, know your customer. Right, um, and make sure that the things that you're talking about are really customer concerns. Now, customer is a broad term here and could mean other things um, to include potential partners, right? That's a customer of the API, uh, but you should still be speaking about how you might engage with partners in a way that serves your customers, right? So that's, uh, that's still true. Um, just that very act, that cultural shift toward putting customers first um, can really help you zoom in on these relationships in a lot smarter way. And that's why I put that as step one. The second is if you already have APIs out there and you know, my guess is folks attending a conference like this have already done some form of you know, at least dabbling in this um, and you're trying to figure out how to put together a smarter strategy around what you're doing, uh, get more focused about it, maybe get more funding for it. Um, look at how it's being used you know, uh, dig into who's using it the most or who's doing the most interesting things with it. Um, you know, what kind of data can you gather, um, not maybe only about volume, but what kinds of things they're, they're uh, doing with it? What kind of impact it might have on say your churn or your revenue? How can you understand what you have in place? Um, and use all of this to reach what I think is the most essential point in drilling down into these relationships is, you know, 
are there partners involved? Are there people using this, that you intend to use this API that are not your customers? Uh, and what's valuable for them, right? This, the partnership's about a, a trade of equity, right? It's an equitable relationship. You know, you scratch uh, my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, we both get something out of this. And that may not be uh, financial directly, but it should have something that we, we both succeed as businesses. And boiling that down into simple terms uh, is really important. Um, do they need your customer's data? Because that's a big step, right? Uh, in terms of your customer's trust, which means that you're gonna have to do things like get their consent to give that data up. Now you're going down the kind of OAuth 2 path, right? And if you're not, you should. Um, so, you know, but that's not always a cheap thing to get stood up. So that may be, become a big barrier to doing APIs appropriately if you're talking external. Um, do they need specific customer's data or are they just looking for aggregate stuff that you don't necessarily need consent for, right? That can make a big difference in kind of your implementation plan and some of the security and privacy concerns involved. Or is this just customers want their own data? They have some automation need and you've got data locked up in your platform that they can't get to uh, or that they can't get to in a programmatic fashion, let's say. Um, that can often be a much simpler path in that giving them that access doesn't involve all that complicated consent and you know all this privacy stuff. It might be a lot easier uh, to do. Um, and you know sometimes folks go, well, APIs are just data, right? Just give them the data that they want uh, or that the data that we have stored, you know. And then you get into these kind of let's just put the database over HTTP and all our problems are solved. But sometimes you're then offloading the burden of the value that they're getting out of your platform onto those API consumers. So is there something that they need aggregated? Are there sort of calculated or action-oriented things that you can provide? So all of this is to boil down, to some extent, you know, what are the use cases, obviously? But if you are framing this in what's the business relationship involved, the way that you would measure success of these things can look pretty different, right? What's gonna make a partnership equitable is gonna be a pretty different set of success measures versus you know, giving customers data that they're already entitled to. Um, certainly there's direct monetization potential in any of these scenarios, but that may not be the only point. For instance, customers getting access to their own data could become a churn Right? They may be tired that they can't automate around your platform. They don't have programmatic access and your competitors do. So that's a competitive risk, it's churn risk. Right? You're gonna measure that success very different than integrating with some other platform may bring you new low churn users who come in the door integrated with low cost integration. Right? Or it could uh, bring in uh, you know, new revenue in forms of uh, you know, partners who can bring you uh, highly qualified customers. Right? very different measures of success, very different sort of attack plans of what you would do to sort of API enable these, these uh, use cases. So in simple terms, know who the, the consumer of this API is gonna be. And I don't mean the developer writing the code. I mean this in business terms. And what does that relationship look like? How would you measure its success, right? That's it. I mean, start there, uh, which, it is about one thing is don't try to do it all, right? If you, if you want to go build a great platform, there's a million ways you can connect it with APIs. Um, but you probably don't want to do them all at the same time and picking, uh, prioritizing is the hard part for the product teams, right? So start with a high level prioritization of business relationships and pick the ones that are going to be the, the, you know, the smartest thing for your growth and maybe your overall business strategy. You know, uh, stay out of ocean boiling exercises to design an entire platform down to the field uh, before you do anything. Find something valuable in the context of a given relationship, ship it, learn from it, and then start doing other things, right? Okay, so um, maybe you've got this framed up. You say that APIs are valuable in general, they're valuable to our business in this way, in these specific relation con uh, relationship contexts. You've already done a lot of the ingredients to say, here's why we should fund a given project. Here's why it should be on our roadmap. But how to do that pitch, I find a lot of folks, uh, especially those coming from kind of engineering backgrounds who find themselves 
being the product owner, even if they don't have the title, they're often ill-equipped for. Um, and this is again where I'm just going to come back to: this is just another product. You know, don't get caught up in the technical weeds. You've got to help kind of the you know MBA types come to the table and understand how does this help me grow the business, right? How is this going to be good for us as a company? Why is it relevant? Um, and if you're you know, why why does this program do good things for us? You've got to be able to boil that down. And some of the steps I give you before help you get there. So, um, you know, got to do your homework before you ask for that time. Um, and, you know, hopefully, by the way, this is not just we, we want to go build this one API on the roadmap, but you've got a, a vision, a picture for, you know, here's what we want to do big picture. And here's the first thing that we want to go do in more precise terms with clear success measures and all those things. But Again, that especially that first thing, if not the whole big picture, is how does this fit into our business model today? Because it's it's noteworthy that quite often opening up these connections and shifting out of a pipeline way of thinking and into maybe a marketplace way of thinking, it may shift the way the business operates in the future. And it's good to recognize those things can present risks and opportunities and be upfront and clear that you've thought through those things, right? How does this fit into our business model today? And is this going to enable getting us where we need to be in the future? Sorry, I already said that. Understand your revenue is shifting from those traditional channels. If you're integrating, um, you know, may that actually hurt today's traditional business and be upfront and honest about that and the risks that it represents so that, you know, no one has any surprises. So on that value of the API, I find that a lot of engineering type folks will kind of get caught up in technical measures, right? Some way to look at, you know, we can get this many calls to the API or something, um, which isn't terribly useful. Um, now, if you can represent that there's some cost savings and shared leverage that more people are using this reusable API, that can certainly be a positive, but it's probably not the primary focus for your business stakeholders. And if it is as a first step, Hopefully there's you know, a, a business growth opportunity that that leads to. Um, and as I said before, if you're shifting into this marketplace construct as part of this kind of transition, um, it's important to kind of call that stuff out and make sure that you're framing things and how, you're good, how you would think that you would manage supply and demand in that new kind of context. If you're, for instance, bringing supply partners instead of sourcing inventory yourself. So uh, boiling that all down, you know, when you go down the long and hard road of building a platform with APIs, um, it, it takes some time. You know, sometimes you got to slow down to speed up and it can get expensive. So if you've got the right business perspective around that up front and the right expectation set from the beginning, you run a far lower chance of your project getting killed off before you've reached kind of the vision of what you're, you're hoping for. And this happens far more often than I think people realize. So, you know, get the business context right. Get that kind of executive buy-in, especially if you're building out kind of a full-scale API program to try to wrangle maybe your microservices sprawl. You need long-term support, and you're really going to have to have a shared vision with your company leadership about how to get there. All right. So boiling down a little bit more, this is what I'm trying to help you not do. Uh, you know, if you're not treating your APIs as products, it, it just becomes this technical commodity, this artifact, right? In, in the user experience world, you, you would never say, just go build the thing uh, and then, you know, uh, it'll do the job, right? That would be nuts. We, we want to have a designed experience. And the same is true with APIs. You know, um, you've got to look at this as, kind of who's the end user and design an end user experience. And none of that will be right if you're not customer centric in your approach, if you don't understand the relationships involved. If you're building in a system centric way with this very internal, you know, inside our four walls of you, you're going to have a engineered experience and it's not going to be very good and you're going to struggle to attract developers to your program. This is true whether we're talking internal or external. You know, these are internal products, treat them as such. All right, and then the easy gimme at the end, uh, this one won't take long. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it's been, I don't know, 10, 10 years or so since I've been doing these kind of public speaking things around APIs. And this is actually the first subject I ever spoke on. And it's still dead true. Uh, and that is, if you're a product manager and you manage APIs, you really have very little excuse for releasing significant defects. And you have almost no excuse to ever reproduce those defects or, or re-release them again. Um, your requirements in a best case scenario should be written in a way that is actually automatable as testing scenarios. I mean, you know, I've historically always liked kind of BDD, Cucumber type approaches. I think there's a lot of different ways to do this now. Um, but you know, you can't afford to have a low quality API, right? Developers who get stuck trying to integrate with you are costly on both sides of any relationship. Uh, and you know, are, it's just, it's too valuable of relationships in almost any case that, that you wanna have a bad experience driving them away. And the other component is that, you know, uh, you know, lots of product managers deal with brittle testing where, you know, uh, user experiences are really hard to keep consistent and high quality. But with APIs, it is a programmatic interface. So it is inherently testable. Uh, and if you're not, if as a product manager, you are not engaged with, maybe it's your QA folks, or if you don't have QA, uh, the folks who are really, you know, uh, or let's say that your, your story is your backlog. If you're not engaging in that testing process, and again, I'm talking about acceptance criteria, kind of acceptance testing, not low level unit testing. It's, can I write in plain English, some form or fashion that's recognizable, readable, if I'm not technical as a product manager, what this thing is meant to do. Start the sprint with it in red and finish, it, finish with it in green. And that is to say, have formal sign off. There's no reason that because it's a technical component that you can't have clear sign off, right? Uh, so really lean into the testing piece and drive for automated acceptance criteria um, so that you catch, uh, you make sure you've built the right thing that does the right job in customer language. And that if you have problems in the future, uh, you know, you, something slips through that uh, you can ensure that it's been fixed and never happens again. So uh, started with my little plug for the uh, podcast, and I'll make yet another one, uh, just in the sense that a lot of what is shared here is really just synthesized from uh, the folks that we talk to on API Intersection. I'd certainly encourage, you know, take some time, uh, you know, when you've got that zone out moment, that long drive, that train ride, whatever, uh, tune in. We're on all the different, uh, you know, podcasting platforms and uh, got a pretty, a lot of different looks at how folks build and consume APIs. And with that. Thanks a lot. Uh, we normally say, what are your questions now? Uh, but in whatever format you're able to submit them, uh, looking forward to hearing them and answering them.